Good afternoon, Kali. Kali Okuno from uh, Cooperation Jackson. Um, welcome and uh, thank you for sparing time to, 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 to meet with us. Um, I'd really like to talk to you about uh, this really quite an extraordinary book, um, Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi. What um, what got you to 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 produce this uh, this this book? What what was what uh, gave rise to it? Well, we have been documenting the process of organizing, um, you know, around the Jackson Cush plan fairly early on. You know, the the plan really got kicked in motion um, in two thousand four, two thousand five. Uh, and we had released a number of just kind of public documents about our thinking, you know, really trying to encourage the the, the movement, uh, particularly trying to rebuild the black liberation movement uh, and just sharing our reflections on what we were doing, why we were doing, what we were hoping to accomplish and where we were at in that process. Um, and then after um, <clears throat> we kind of took the major leap, uh, at least the major public leap, with the project was the, the election of uh, Chokwe Lumumba in 2009 as a city council person. And then uh, uh, his election as mayor in 2013, uh, we were just being inundated with requests from folks all throughout uh, the world. I mean, literally about how did we do it? Um, you know, what were the lessons learned? Uh, and we wanted to be able to tell that story in our own voice, in our own words, from our own perspective, uh, based upon our own analysis, right? And, and uh, we all know um, oftentimes some of the best work of, of oppressed peoples of the working class is written by others <laughs> outside, not in their own words, you know, not from their own point of reference, not from their own point of view. So uh, we wanted to set the record straight as best possible. This is why this is what, this is how, this is when, and this is to what aim and objective, you know, as we see it, uh, trying to, to, to craft it. And so the book really is is uh, to kind of fulfill that. So you don't kind of hear secondhand what's going on from the folks who kind of put this project, you know, together, but firsthand. Um, and so people can, can measure that themselves. But so, so the, the, the spur to it was the, the election of a radical black mayor, Chokwe Lumumba, is that right? I wouldn't say that was, a, I think that was a, a spur for the tremendous re request for information. Right. Uh, but, you know, just, just for my part, you know, uh, um, when I was with the Malcolm X grassroots movement, um, it was something I'd learned, you know, from earlier generations of, of being our, we have to be our own historians. We have to be our own archivists, right. um, you know, and, and making sure that this, this knowledge and information gets out there. Uh, because even if we do something wrong, right, in terms of our approach and we make some mistakes and errors, well, the next generation should know about that so that they can pick it up and do better the next time, right? And and I know for me as a, as a young activist, you know, in the, the late 80s, early 90s, uh, was trying to just go back and look at a number of different things that, you know, my parents and folks in the community were involved in. And there were tons of things about uh, uh, the Black Panther Party, for instance. There were a few things. I was in, in Los Angeles. A few things about the US organization, you know, here and there, uh, uh, works about SNCC that were out, works about uh, SCLC. Uh, but, you know, the, the countless number of, of other black radical formations that were out there from, you know, uh, uh, the League of Revolutionary Struggle, um, you know, there was hardly anything available about them. So other than just folks I knew who were involved in those kind of uh, word of mouth, you know, that was very helpful, but it was not helpful to share with my comrades and colleagues who were my generation for us to have study materials, you know, uh, and things to gather from and think so many things were mediated by personal relationships, right? And so, uh, because my family uh, uh, was deeply involved 
uh, in the Black Liberation Movement, I had a lot of access, but a lot of the folks around me uh, who didn't have these types of relationships, you know, uncles and relatives or direct family members in my case who were involved, uh, they were often kind of denied that information and those stories. And so I, I took it upon myself to just write, start, and I was, you know, when I first started, I was terrible at it. Um, and so I just, just, just write notes and, and just print notes or disseminate notes. And eventually over time, just seeing the need for us to document and to propagate our own ideas, uh, started taking the craft of writing much more seriously and developed it as a habit um, to really get the information out there uh, to be able to spread the knowledge and, and spread the wealth as, as, as I see it, you know, cause all those informations, you know, the, the things that I will, you know, be, I became an avid book collector uh, <laughs> from being an organizer, like not the other way around. It was me seeking answers and knowing that, you know, uh, many people had tried uh, some of the, the, the same things that I was uh, working on. So one of the main things, for instance, I got started, you know, kind of kind of got my teeth cut on was helping to organize uh, gang truce, you know, work activity in my neighborhood, which is a big thing in, in L.A. in the late 1990s that many forces you know, worked on um, and, and dealing with police terror, you know, uh, uh, in my neighborhood growing up in Linwood, uh, California and having to deal with the sheriff department, you know, uh, snatching people up and dropping them off in, in other gang territories so the, the heighten conflicts, you know, this happened to me. So we were trying to figure out, well, how do we fight against, you know, the, the police terror? Uh, and again, we knew about, you know, the cop watch kind of patrols and the things that uh, Panthers and, and the Revolutionary Action Movement and, and even organizations before then had done to a, to a certain extent. Um, but we didn't, we didn't, outside of talking to the, the kind of the elders of that time, we didn't really, all, you know, have like a lot of materials to say, well, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three. And so, you know, uh, I would just, anything and everything I would see at a, at a bookstore or community activity or, you know, community lecture or something like that, if I had a penny, I'd suck it up or I'd, I'd work out arrangements with, with folks you know, um, I'll come work for you if I can get that book. You know, I would do that particularly with, with Esawan. Like, I don't have the money for that book, but I'll, I'll come work, you know, two or three hours at your next festival and folks will take it up, you know, so I get my hands on these materials and then be able to photocopy it and do that stuff to disseminate it and put it out. Um, so learning that lesson, that's just something I've tried to carry forward, you know, because there's so many times, you know, so many younger activists have, have uh, when I meet them or come and encounter these folks, well, what about this and what about that? And I'm just like, well, here you go. And now, now you can digitize so many things. But like, well, right. what's your email? Let me email you some materials. Yeah. But they first have to be produced. And we were trying to make sure that we had an accurate record from our own perspective that that outlined this history and this experiment and what was what was drawn from it. Um, so, and so really try to encourage others to do the same. Help us understand. I mean, you 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 set up uh, Cooperation Jackson. Can you say something a little bit about that? Uh, what what was Cooperation? What is Cooperation Jackson? Yeah, uh, it's a. I mean, uh, it's a network of cooperatives and other uh, solidarity economy support institutions. And so, what do I mean by that? Uh, the bedrock, really, of of all of our work in Cooperation Jackson has been uh, the development of our community land trust. So it's the Fannie Lou Hamer Community Land Trust, which comprises the property you see behind me, several of them across the street. Um, uh, there's over uh, 50 properties uh, in it, uh, the community land trust, uh, and we do our uh, farming uh, there, uh, all of our facilities, the Balagoon Center, uh, which is our main office and hub, the Ida B. Wells Plaza, uh, which is our largest uh, uh, piece, which is a whole block basically that we own uh, where there's several storefronts uh, that are a part of it. Um, and uh, then our community production uh, center uh, is also a part of the community uh, land trust in addition to uh, four houses that are in use now as part of a housing co-op uh, and many more that we're now, you know, in, in the midst of COVID-19 uh, actually revitalizing since there's been kind of a slowdown, we found some areas and our work that we can speed up, and that's one of them. And um, you know, the book 
the, the, the focus on economic democracy uh, is really trying to tout uh, the work of Cooperation Jackson, but beyond that, like the need uh, to articulate and, and, and create economic democracy, you know, democracy from the ground up uh, that democratizes the workplace, you know, which we have to recall for most of us, that is where we actually spend 50% of our adult lives is in workplace and it's the least democratic space uh, that exists for the vast majority of us. Uh, so that's the piece. And then for us, it's, that is a core building block uh, towards building uh, an eco-socialist future, eco-socialist politics. Um, and so uh, Jackson Rising really is kind of a, a, a touchstone and we were trying to make it so that we answered it so they could be kind of a how-to in many respects uh, of what folks can do uh, to kind of pick up some of these tools and, and figure out how to organize them in your community. Understanding that, you know, uh, conditions and terms uh, are different everywhere, uh, but we think there are some universal dimensions to, to organizing, which is first and foremost, building relationships uh, that, that are transferable uh, everywhere that, where there is humans. So uh, we just wanted to share our perspective and, and interject in particular, the, the the politics of transformation that we are trying to get across, which are first and foremost uh, rooted in black liberation, uh, but on a deep, on a broader level, uh, aimed towards you know a, a socialist transition uh, that would encompass all of humanity. So that's that's what the book is really uh, trying to make a contribution to, uh, and we think it's a critical one in these times. Uh, you know, as as uh, the struggle for black liberation has become uh, a rallying cry uh, across the globe, uh, really, you know, uh, ignited in part uh, by uh, the killing of, of George Floyd uh, and what led to the, the Floyd Rebellion, which started in June, the beginning of June, and it's still going on to this day, right? So we, we're now with a full uh, two months and some change uh, in. And uh, we like to think that this book and our work uh, kind of laid some foundations for uh, the motion and the politics that are now uh, on display in, uh, in the demands that you hear and the articulation of uh, what communities are organizing themselves to do. Um, we think this work played a small part uh, uh, in that and continues to have some role to play uh, as many younger generations are, are uh, I think, now scrounging for answers like now. Uh, you know, even though the street action in a lot of places has not stopped, yeah. uh, I think many are now trying to figure out, well, what is the next step? How do we gain more actual control uh, over our over our lives, you know, over our bodies, over our minds? And, and we hope this can be a contribution. Well, I mean, the, 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 the book, even though it was published now several years ago, uh, is still a, a vibrant text. It's 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 one I think people recognize uh, the power of the of the experiences that you brought together and the reflections that you've posed uh, uh, in that. But, but what are the lessons that you've learned uh, looking back? Okay, I mean, uh, it was a particular moment in history that, that you brought together uh, those essays, those contributions from a number of people. So what are, what what there's been struggles ever since. Uh, mm -hmm. Chokwe Lumumbe unfortunately died. There were struggles right, there. Right. Um, and you you were um, one of Chokwe's um, uh, deputies there in, in, the, in the council. So, right. um, so, but now, what, what, what are the main lessons that you have learned? Well, one outside that I think is coming to the fore right now is the struggle for clarity, the struggle for political clarity. It's paramount. Uh, what are we aiming to do and why? Like, what are our goals? What are our objectives? Uh, and what are we hoping to accomplish? And you see this play out uh, in so many different ways. But one that you see, I think, is going to be um, uh, a real catalytic force uh, in the short term is this debate around, do, do we mean defund the police, like completely? Or do we just mean reform the police? And some people use the the, the term uh, to kind of mean both things, but it's something where in reality, 
um, the two are actually going in opposite directions uh, and, and are kind of diametrically opposed to each other. Um, but without clarity and the struggle for clarity, one could be using like the same phraseology and the same terms and the mm -hmm. same words, but mean profoundly different things. And believe me, um, abolishing the police and the reforming the police lead to vastly different types of societies, vastly different types of outcomes. And I think we uh, learned uh, that, that we uh, uh, were often using the same words in our work and struggle here, but sometimes meant profoundly different things. And as things became uh, more critical, it became more sharp, became more articulated, the variance in those meanings became more acute. And we quickly and sometimes painfully found out uh, that we were going in different directions, that we that we wanted kind of different things, uh, even though we had we had kind of reared ourselves and organized ourselves on some common language or some common terminology. But that struggle for clarity, what do we really mean? Uh, that was paramount. That is one of the biggest uh, lessons that I have drawn from this entire experience. That I know I'm the much more richer for it. Um, and have learned, I think, uh, um, tremendous ways, uh, Feroz and everybody, um, you know, to what it means to be a democratic being, a democratic subject. Not saying that I'm fully there. Uh, I, I was raised, you know, under the guise and, and, and under the whip of, of uh, settler colonialism and white supremacy and patriarchy and, and all those things are still embedded in me. But this struggle, I think, has unwound many of those things and uncovered those uh, for me where I'm constantly being exposed to the fallacies in my own thinking, right? Uh, and old assumptions that I'm like, I don't know what I was thinking 10 years ago, how I came to that conclusion, um, you know, based upon what I know now, I'd be like, no, that this, you know, and there's sometimes, there's even some things in the book that I read and I'm like, ah, I would, I would phrase that differently now, right? Or I would be be more clear at this particular point uh, to really articulate and highlight, you know, what's the difference here? And in, in, you can follow this path and it'll lead you in this course. If you follow this path or this meaning, it'll lead you in another course. Um, so some profound lessons that we still aim to try to uh, uh, impart, uh, you know, and the, and the work to... Um, not just capture this moment in a particular moment in time or, or a process, you know, which the, the Jackson Rising ended in 2017, basically, and we're still working to give it more definition, you know, as we go forward and producing new works. Uh, but I think there's still some some gems there. But that the, the struggle for clarity, I think, is one of the, the critical ones. And like I said, you know, you see it in the in the here and now uh, and how this is going and and. And why why it makes a difference, yeah. right? Why it makes a difference because um, if you even if you look at where uh, here I'm based in the United States, Mississippi's in the United States. You know, this is for an international audience. You know, and and, and the the where this goes on the national stage and how it's interpreted in these upcoming elections in the next couple of months, what a little bit more than ninety days, I think now. You know, Biden's and the Democratic Party's refusal to even accept the reform demand makes a tremendous difference as to kind of what mandate they may or may not have should there be a changing of the guard. If the elections actually go through and there's some possibility that they might or there may be a major constitutional crisis uh, in November, that's what I think we're, we're headed to. But, you know, whoever picks up that mantle, in the face of, of what has developed in the consciousness which has emerged, they are not going to be able to sweep the call for abolishing the, the police through the means of defunding and other means. They're not going to be able to sweep that in the rug. And it, it winds up begging the question, what type of new constituency, what type of new base might the Democrats have 
once they come into off office, right? Once they kind of come quote unquote into power. And if they don't have kind of a popular mandate driven by the movement, what are they gonna to do to the movement? So this becomes a real paramount question. And I think we saw, or we're seeing a kind of a preview of what that might look like uh, up in the Northwest right now, up, up in uh, Portland, uh, where uh, Trump created a crisis by bringing in these, these federalized troops that were under his direct control, you know, that were just basically conducting a low grade counterinsurgency uh, operation up there in Portland for several weeks. Uh, then the governor wound up having to make a deal, which many liberals kind of touted as, as as progress, but it's something, again, in the struggle for clarity, we need to really interrogate. Because what that deal basically did was put the onus of repression onto the state government. It didn't eliminate state repression. It didn't eliminate uh, uh, the threat of force or the, the you know the threat of terror, it just just placed it to another entity, which said we'll we'll do this and do it perhaps in a more humane way than you did it. But it's not like the 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 iron fist was actually removed. It was just kind of disguised, if you would, with with the silky velvet glove. But it's still there, and that's going to make a, a I think a real difference as to you know how a kind of can the, the more revolutionary forces that have emerged during the Floyd Rebellion, can they and will they find some level of common cause with the more liberal forces who claim to want reform and claim to want justice, but they want it within the parameters and framework that they are accustomed to and which, quite frankly, they can dictate the pace and orientation of, which has really not changed. But you know, there's only so far these two can go in some type of partnership or some type of dance uh, to move things forward. And it's going to have to be a real struggle for clarity, uh, I think, on our part, speaking more from a revolutionary perspective, uh, to, to dig in and do the organizing work and the convincing work uh, to, to move folks towards kind of adopting a full on abolitionist position and all that comes with it. Because it's not like you can just reform the police and leave the rest of society intact and think that things are going to be okay. Capital will find some way to use that uh, if there's not a revolution, because that can only really happen in the context of a revolution, social revolution. That can only really happen uh, uh, if everything fundamentally changes. And if it doesn't, best believe the Amazons of the world uh, or the Googles of the world, uh, or the the you know uh, Microsofts of the world. I'm trying to cite things that are in that region. They will just create their own Pinkertons, their own private armies, if if the system is left intact. Uh, they do. Uh, You're right. <laughs> uh, but so help us understand um, to what extent. Uh, the experiences of um, the period of Jackson Rising and the establishment of Cooperation Jackson, the link between that and uh, the People's Strike, which you've every beginning of every month since uh, May, June, July, August, there has been uh, regular discussions and organizing and bringing focus on the struggles that are happening on the streets. Um, what, what's the connection? Why is that? Because you have been absolutely in the center of promoting this initiative. Mm -hmm. it, it grows out of our experience, some of which is re reflected directly in the book. Uh, and it's critical, I think, for folks to understand that Cooperation Jackson and the Jackson Cush plan and its current kind of iteration, the one that you see within the Jackson Rising work, is the byproduct of what happened in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi 15 years ago in the wake of Hurricane Katrina in the great flood that hit New Orleans uh, and several other cities on the coast of, uh, of Mississippi, Gulfport, Gulfport and Biloxi. So many of those lessons, those hard lessons uh, in the, the strategic framework was really a product of that. And it's been part of our analysis that the stage is kind of 
decayed terminal stage of, of where capitalism is and has been actually for quite some time now, uh, that more of these kind of man-made catastrophes uh, that have been accept- that are being accelerated by uh, the man-made or, or human-driven uh, climate change, which is just uh, spiraling out of control, like right before our eyes. This, this, this now, for instance, is looking like 2020 is going to be another record-breaking year for for hurricane season. Um, so it was our analysis, and it's been our analysis that more catastrophes like this are on the way, that they're going to become commonplace, and that we need to prepare our, our communities with the institutional and infrastructure kind of resiliency that will be needed. Because knowing that, as we learned in Katrina, the US government is not going to respond to put the interests of people first. That's not what it's going to do. We learned that the hard way. Uh, and we've been trying to get everybody to understand that. And we've just seen that play out even more mm-hmm. you know, disastrously with COVID-19. But I think because we were a bit prepared and we had some experience in this way, uh, it enabled us to put out the call, uh, which led to people strike, saying that we had to take this serious. We're, we're sharing our experience and letting people know that the U.S. government is not going to respond in a way that's going to protect black folks, brown folks, indigenous folks. We've seen it before. We want to share that and impart their knowledge to you and get folks organized uh, to not only defend their communities, but we were pushing for and continue to push for in the people's strike, organizing towards a general strike as a means of peacefully transforming and transition society to something more humane, where, where people are put over, people and planet are put over profits. Uh, and then from our perspective, as, as individualistically as an organization, move society again towards this kind of eco-socialist horizon. Um, that is why we put out this. And we just were, were saying, you know, nobody could have necessarily predicted COVID-19, uh, but you could predict to a certain thing, sadly, and many scientists ha- have said that there were going to be more of these kind of novel viruses that erupt because of uh, how humanity is destroying the ecosystem and, and uh, with the, the kind of deeper penetration we're getting into uh, now rainforests. Uh, and other kind of habitats that we're just kind of exposing all of these pathogens uh, and they're spreading in new uh, 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 ways that folks are encroaching on uh, uh, the environment. Uh, So we could see this coming. And so, you know, we didn't predict COVID-19, you know, by no stretch of the imagination, but it was something that uh, several members, myself, including Cooperation Jackson, had an early eye out on, I mean, real early, following this from some uh, the obscure reports around uh, uh, diseases in China kind of emerging. Um, that has been on our watch and we wanted to a, share that uh, and to put people in, in a position to be able to respond. Um, and, and it was our also our perspective of things that we learned from Katrina and what we've learned since then that we can organize our own communities. We can organize them to be economically viable and self-sufficient. Like we've been gradually moving in that direction here in Jackson. It's it's still got a long way to go, but we've been moving in that direction and seeing direct results. And we wanted to kind of uh, uh, put that charge out, that call out, and open the imagination, you know, of of uh, folks in the United States first and foremost, where we're situated, but understanding that this is a global pandemic. It's going to require global solutions in the end, uh, and to get that. Uh, rolling, but the first critical thing is uh, we put out that call towards moving towards a general strike, not because we thought it was immediately possible, but to open the imagination and say this is necessary and can we get ourselves organized to actually meet what the times demand, and and that challenge is still before us. Yeah. Now, um, really, just to conclude, uh, what is really interesting has been that uh, the Jackson Rising is, uh, is has been translated into uh, Catalan and into Spanish. Um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm about uh, the contents of this book. C- can you say why is it that there should be this interest in, in, in Spain? 
and in Catalonia? Well, you know, we, we, I think Barcelona and Catalonia in particular, you know, folks should know that there's a long history of uh, radical cooperative activity there. Um, you know, the, the Spanish revolution in the 1930s, uh, Barcelona in particular and Catalonia in particular were really kind of strongholds of that, uh, which is one of the most unique events in history. We encourage everybody to kind of look that up, uh, what happened there, right? And what can be learned from there? Uh, we learned a lot and we've tried to apply certain aspects of that history and that, that learning uh, to our work. But we've also learned, and this is very critical, Cooperation Jackson has drawn very heavily from the experience of, of cooperative uh, 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 economics and the and development of the solidarity economy from Latin America that really just took a tremendous explosion uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, particularly kind of a, a new front of that was really opened up in 1994. I mean, there was work on that even earlier, but 1994 was I think when, I know my and many other people's kind of imagination was really sparked by the Zapatista uh, uprising and rebellion uh, uh, in Chiapas uh, and how that introduced uh, both indigenous ways of kind of reorganizing the economy and society, but also uh, brought to the fore collective and solidarity practice on a new level. And that wave just really spread throughout uh, Latin America in, in Brazil and in, in uh, Venezuela. And we've learned, you know, a, a number of uh, 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 tremendous things like participatory budgeting, human rights budgeting, how folks have done uh, uh, people's assemblies or populist assemblies. Um, you know, we took a lot of different phrases and in, in, in terms from that, uh, this notion of protagonistic uh, uh, and antagonistic uh, uh, democracy and advocacy that we drew heavily from, uh, from, from Venezuela that we tried to incorporate here uh, uh, with our uh, kind of electoral pursuits. So we want to, in, in, in effect, give a summary back, if you would, to, to Latin America to say, this is what we've learned from you. This is how we interpreted it. This is uh, what we have gained from trying to put it in, in, the, in the practice in our particular context under these conditions in the United States, you know, uh, uh, under the guise of, you know, one of the most entrenched forms of kind of white supremacy, uh, uh, and, and the deep uh, nature of, of, of uh, neoliberal uh, capitalism and individualism and how they intertwine here in the United States. These are some of the breakthroughs that we've had. This is how we accomplished them. Uh, we think this might uh, help reinvigorate some of the movements in, in Latin America, which have been under tremendous pressure. You know, there's a right wing uh, near dictatorship in, in, in uh, Brazil now. Uh, where a lot of the this work, you know, the, the solidarity economy cooperative work was booming uh, in Brazil in the 90s and 2000s and it's taken some hits uh, of, of late under the tremendous forms of repression that Bolsonaro and others uh, um, have, have instituted uh, throughout the state. We've seen major kind of setbacks in uh, Venezuela with the, the embargo and the choking of the economy there. Um, you know, also some setbacks in Bolivia and other places, but the foundations are still there. Uh, and so we want to uh, uh, kind of give back uh, and, and share. And, and that's having this work, you know, being translated by our comrades uh, uh, in Barcelona, uh, uh, the invisible city, La Ciudad, uh, uh, Ciudad Invis Invisible, uh, doing this critical work, um, we think will help spread this to a kind of a whole new knowledge and we can have a deeper level of dialogue and exchange with millions of more people as a direct result. And so that's what we're looking for. So this uh, interview we're doing uh, is um, primarily designed to uh, be sent to the Catalonian uh, comrades uh, uh, so that they can provide a, um, a, a translation of, of, of this. Um, any last message you'd like to convey to them? Last messages, last words. You know, we were we were really looking forward to being in Barcelona um, in May. Uh, there was a, a World Social Forum of, of uh, Alternative Economies uh, that was being put together by many of the folks who were working on the translation. And we wanted to do a deep dive uh, and exchange. 
And so our last words are, we are going to connect again. Uh, we're going to find some creative ways. We're going to build the bridges, build the links, uh, and, and do the unfinished work of uh, tying our solidarity economy project and work together. Um, even despite, you know, the, the, the limitations of COVID-19, that work is still uh, before us and we, we are looking forward to doing it. Uh, we thank you for taking on this task of doing this translation, uh, both in Spanish and in, in, in Catalan, um, and a luta continua. Indeed. Kali Okulu, thank you for joining us today uh, and uh, keep well and grow strong. Uh, solidarity to you all. Thank you.